everybody, what's going on? Jeff Rager, another episode of The Daily Ticket. It's a Thursday, the 9th of May. It's 2024. How the hell is everybody doing? We're so close to the weekend, Mother's Day weekend. How's the shopping going? Have you found your mom or your wife the perfect gift? You know what's so unfair? My daughter at school will make the cutest little, I don't know, coffee mug out of clay for my wife. And my wife will love it. She'll cherish it. She'll put it in the curio cabinet. She'll give hugs and kisses to my daughter. I mean, she'll totally dig it. Then there's me. My wife expects so much from me as far as gifts go. I've been racking my brain. I've been going to various shops. I've been on Amazon. I'm thinking about ordering something, having it go through my brother's house so my wife doesn't know. I can surprise her on Sunday. It's so hard to get a good gift. I feel like you got to nail Mother's Day. The birthday is a big one, but Mother's Day is a huge one. I feel if you don't get the mom a good gift, she thinks that you think that she's not doing a good enough job, maybe. I don't know. There's a lot of pressure, a lot of stress to really hit the Mother's Day gift out of the ballpark. I can't tell you what I got her so far. I don't want on the off chance that she watches this and she knows. I think it's good enough. I'll let you know on Monday. What about you, though? Any stress associated with the Mother's Day gifts? Like, you can't just, like, I don't know, go to Meyer, buy some flowers, give it to your wife or your mom and say, like, hey, happy Mother's Day. They expect more. They might not say they expect more, but damn it, they expect more. Great stress associated with the Mother's Day gift. For me, Father's Day, it's so easy. Like, I already told my wife what I want. It's golf-related. Buy it for me. I will be ecstatic. Her? She never tells me what she wants. Very difficult. Kind of like watching the Tigers. In fact, I would rather go shopping every day for my wife's Mother's Day gift than watch another inning of Detroit Tiger baseball. This fucking team, guys. Like, honestly, this team is infuriating. They did it again yesterday. Yesterday, the team's in Cleveland, last game of the six-game road trip, had a chance, a great chance, to leave Cleveland having taken a series from a first-place team. Come back to Detroit for the off day today, get ready to play the Astros tomorrow, be only three games out of first place in the AL Central. Tigers led 4-2 to two pretty much the entirety of the game. And, of course, they lost. They lost again. I mean, the Tigers just throw away games. In the last week alone, they've urinated away at least five to six games. Just giving them away. And yeah, it's only one game. And yeah, there's over 100 left. And yeah, it's May. But if you want to make the postseason, and I'm starting to believe this team will not make the playoffs. But if you want to make the playoffs, these games matter. They really do. Every game matters, whether it's in April, May, or September. Everyone matters, and you cannot just keep giving away. All these great pitching performances, and you just keep giving them away. Like Jack Flaherty has had two epic pitching performances. Tigers have lost both games. Tarek Skubal struck out 12 Yankees on Sunday. Tigers lost that game 5-3. to three. Reese Olsen. Pitch is great, it seems like. Every outing gets zero run support. Tigers have lost those games as well. Five games in the last week plus a day. Tigers should have, could have won, and they didn't because they either did something stupid or they just simply couldn't hit. But yesterday, yesterday took it all, man. Yesterday really topped the cake. I mean, if it wasn't the Andy Abanez error, Tigers trying to turn a double play. Abanez loses a ball right here in the sunlight, trying to turn a double play at second base. Ball rolls to right field. Error. There was a Jake Rogers error. The catcher for the Tigers trying to gun somebody at second base, stealing. Ball trickles into center field. Costly error. And then there was Javier Baez. Now, Javi Baez maybe had the most infuriating play of the day. We'll get into how the Guardians came back. 
But Baez in the 10th inning was the bonus runner. He was the ghost runner, right? You know how it is in baseball these days. You go extras. You get a guy on second base. Baez on a routine ground ball to shortstop got thrown out at second. Like he tried to go to third, realized he wasn't going to make it, and he got gunned at second base. Tigers pretty much out of the inning at that point because they lost their ghost runner and they ended up losing the ball game five to four and ten. It was awful. It was little league base running. And the funny thing about Javier Baez is at least twice this week, I've seen Baez gun a guy at third or at least try because on a routine ball, the shortstop guy in second base tries to advance and Javi's like, no, that's not going to happen. Guns it, dude. Why did he try to advance? Tigers end up losing. They go one in five on the road trip. And I could sit here and I can bitch about the hitting. The Tigers did get all of four runs, all in one inning, the fourth inning. And in nine of 10 total innings, they scored zero runs. After exploding for 11 the other day, they scored four. We can bitch about Scott Harris. We can bitch about Javier Baez. We can talk about Colt Keith and Spencer Torkelson, how they're not ready for the bigs, how Tork might need to get sent down. I mean, we can talk about this stuff. I feel we've talked about this stuff before, though. Something that nobody talks about, something that I've been thinking about for a while now, and I'm not saying it's all his fault, but A.J. Hinch gets so much love. A.J. Hinch. Nobody has a bad word to say about the guy. A.J. Hinch is thought to be Casey Stengel for crying out loud. But is he doing a great job? In yesterday's game, this blows me away. A.J. Hinch. First of all, he took out Reese Olsen. 89 pitches. Reese Olsen just retired 14 Guardians in a row. 14 Guardians in a row. 89 pitches. For some reason or another, AJ took him out. I wouldn't know why he took him out because nobody from the media asked him. I went back. I tried to watch the post-game availability. I didn't see any questions about that. Why are you taking out Reese Olsen? Dude was rolling. Anyway, then instead of using any other reliever, AJ in the seventh inning uses Jason Foley. Now, I understand Foley has had some issues recently. I understand Foley has some of his velocity that has kind of been cut down miles per hour wise. I get that. But why are you using Foley in the seventh inning? Why? And it's not even against the heart of the order. He used Jason Foley in the seventh inning. It made absolutely no sense to me. But Foley got through the seventh inning. Eighth inning, Guardian score a run. So 4-2 four, become, four, so four, becomes 4-3. Four, and then in the ninth inning, this is what really killed me. For some reason or another, A.J. Hinge puts in Andrew Chafin. Now, Andrew Chafin has had a great season from the pen, but he's a lefty specialist. His main power is going against other lefties, and he's really good against lefties. And you know the new rules in baseball. If you put a guy in, he's got to stay out there for at least three innings or until the inning ends. So in the ninth inning, he already used up Jason Foley. Okay? It's a 4-3 game. One run game. You put an Andrew Chafin, who's not a closer, in there against Josh Naylor and David Fry. Now, maybe AJ's thinking, okay, he's going to face a lefty, a righty, and a lefty. Hopefully, he gets everybody out. He gets the save. We go home a winner, and we take the series. But Josh Naylor against lefties, he's a lefty. He hits 300 with 1,000 OPS. Pretty good numbers. Why are you throwing in Andrew Chafin in that situation? And then came the next batter, a right-handed hitter, David Fry, who against lefties this season is hitting damn near 400, 391 with an 1,100 OPS. So let me get this straight. A.J. Hinch uses up his closer in the seventh inning, makes zero sense. Took out Reese Olsen after retiring 14 in a row. 
at 89 pitches makes zero sense. And then you're throwing out Andrew Chafin to get a save when he's not your closer. And you're throwing him out to face a right-hander who destroys lefties. Like, what are we doing, AJ? What are we doing? Of course, David Fry goes yard, ties up the game, and Guardians end up winning it in 10 innings. We already told you about Javier Baez, for some reason or another, thinks he's in Little League trying to run to third base and ends up getting thrown out at second. But if you want to focus on A.J. Hinch, what is with these bullpen moves? And this isn't the only time he's done it. Twice in a week, A.J. Hinch is throwing out some dude from the pen, not named Jason Foley, to close a game. And I know A.J. Hinch is going to tell you, well, you know what? We really don't have a closer, okay? It's all about high leverage situations. I find it hard to believe that he thought going against not the heart of the order in the seventh inning in a two-run game was way more high leverage than in the ninth inning with a guy that doesn't close games. Like, that is the biggest piece of bullshit to me, at least I think. I'm no skipper. I'm no baseball savant. But if I hear one more person say, well, you know what? We use our best pitcher and we don't believe in a closer. That's nonsense. There's something about a closer. I don't know what it is, but those three outs are different. Ask anybody in baseball. They'll tell you those three outs in the ninth inning are different. And you better get somebody out there that knows how to handle them. You think the Yankees back in the day would ever say, hey, Mariano Rivera, you're one of the greatest closers ever. Let's have you pitch the seventh. You think that's going to happen? I mean, come on, man. Give me a break. What are we doing here? Twice in eight days, A.J. Hanch is throwing out a reliever to get lit up in the ninth inning, costing you a game. Happened in game one of a doubleheader against the Cardinals last Tuesday. Jack Flaherty struck out 14 Cardinals. That's a career high. And Shelby Miller closing out the game for some reason. And, of course, he gave up the game. Then yesterday, Andrew Chafin closing out the game for some reason. And, of course, he gave up the game. But it's not even just these moves that agitates me about A.J. Go back to Friday in the Bronx. Tigers led 1-0 the entire way. You get to the bottom of the ninth inning. Tigers not ready for a bunt, despite the batter that bunted, showing bunt. Where were you there, A.J. Hinch? Where were you there? Tigers not intentionally walking a guy to set up a force at any base in the ninth inning. Same game. Where were you there, AJ? But more than anything, this guy has been around for four years. And listen, I understand a good manager needs good talent. I totally get it. But you're looking at this team, and they got some pretty stellar pitching. And they haven't won enough games. Why? Because the offense stinks. And sure, you can blame Scott Harris for that, without a doubt. But doesn't AJ Hinch take some of that blame as well? Four years, who is he developed? Four years! How many calls do you have to take about who's the batting coach? Well, they got three of them now. You need three batting coaches and you still can't hit the baseball? How many games do the Tigers have to lose in infuriating fashion before your skipper says anything, throws over a chair, goes all Jim Leland on somebody? Now, listen, I get it. It needs to be organic. I totally understand. But where's that fire? Hell, Mark kind of got screwed, boned the other day. It was on Monday in Cleveland. Dude struck out looking, and it was maybe the worst strike zone I've ever seen in my life. Where's AJ there? He's not running out, sticking up for his guys. I'm sick of bitching about Scott Harris. He's done a bad job, at least in my opinion, in getting enough bats to make you competitive. I'm sick of bitching about ownership. I'm sick of bitching about Javi Baez or Parker Meadows or Cole Keith or Spencer Torkelson. We've bitched about them all. The one guy that nobody ever says a damn bad word about is A.J. Hinch. And I'm just really curious why. I'm curious why. I'm not saying to fire the guy, but I am curious if you think this guy is as good as everybody else thinks he is. Let me know. 
Because this team does not play like a good baseball team. Here's another thing. Whatever happened to clean baseball? Remember, clean baseball. That lasted about a week. How many times are you going to see an error? Something shouldn't happen on an A.J. Hinch managed baseball team. So listen, maybe you're one of these people, and my buddy, and I was talking about this yesterday on the radio, sent me a text, and it said the following. He said, A.J., really? He smoked and married to get this team wins. It's a bad team, some pitching, and that's all in Riley Green. So there's a lot of people that say, hey, listen, it's a baseball manager. A baseball skipper can only be as good as the players he has on his team, and that's fine. But I'm curious if you're as annoyed with A.J. Hinch as I am. And why does this guy get off scot-free? Like, if we're going to bitch about everybody in the organization like we have over this start where they're one game above 500 and five games out of first place, why doesn't the skipper take more beef? I'm asking. What do you think? Hit me up in the comment section if you'd be so kind. Let me know. All right, let's do some comments. And then let's get out of here. By the way, tomorrow on the Daily Ticket, Brad Holmes was on the morning show today. So tomorrow I'll let you know what Brad Holmes had to say. I guarantee he's going to be asked about Jared Goff, contract extensions, and maybe he's even asked about the one unnamed executive calling him borderline arrogant. So look for Brad Holmes' audio tomorrow on the Daily Ticket. Yesterday's podcast was all about Jared Goff. It was about Brad Holmes. It was about do the Lions need Goff more or does Goff need the Lions more? I asked the question, are you starting to wonder if Brad Holmes even wants to extend Jared Goff? Maybe he believes Hendon Hooker's his guy. Here's what people had to say. At Max Mayer, 6838, Holmes has always stated that Goff was his QB. I think the QB that got them a quarter from the Super Bowl is in his future plans. That got a bunch of replies. At Thomas Watkins, 3686. I'd say you believe too much in last year. Ask the Rams if they could do no better and got any further without Goff. They'll tell you what you won't tell yourself. Interesting. At Jaya, a thousand. Tenth best quarterback in the NFL isn't easy to replace. Could get stuck in QB hell without Goff. At Thomas Watkins, 3686 replied, um, there are 32 teams in the league, so 10 isn't elite by any means, and I'd argue he's closer to 12 to 15. Thomas Watkins doesn't seem to like Jared Goff. That's what I'm coming away with. How about this one? At Talon Telford, that would be a knife in the back. I think he's talking about not extended Jared Goff. How about one more for you? Let's see. At Clinton Humor, I really wish we would just pay Goff and reward him for the play he's given us the last two years. I mean, do you really want to pay the guy a ton of money and extend him to a huge contract and a decent amount of term for what he's already done? No, you want to pay a guy for what he's about to do, hopefully. That's the trick, at least in my mind. So. A lot of people watch the podcast, listen to the podcast, and a lot of people, believe it or not, said, yeah, you know what? I'm cool with golf moving on. Maybe Hendon Hooker is our guy. I thought it was interesting. And maybe we'll find out later today when Holmes talks to the morning show. How eager is Brad Holmes to extend Jared Goff? That's what I wonder. And the fact that Goff essentially is in the last year of his deal. OTAs are just around the corner. Usually when a QB is in the last year of his deal, he holds out. Now, I don't think Goff is going to do that, but it could get contentious, could it? If he's not inked up to a contract extension and the Lions are expecting him to be their QB next year, why would he play without a contract? Why would you risk your health? Would he hold out? I don't know the answers to these things, but I do think the closer we get to the season and the longer it goes without extending Jared Goff, I think this gets really interesting. So let me know what you think. Thank you for watching and listening as always on the Daily Ticket. Also, please comment on the AJ Hinch stuff. Am I just being a jerk because they lose too much? But why is it that AJ Hinch gets off scot-free when everybody else in the organization gets best? I'm curious. Let me know. 
In the meantime, enjoy your Thursday. We'll catch you tomorrow. We got Brad Holmes audio, and it's a Friday. Until then, bye, everybody. See ya. 